This is a Rubo workbench. You can build it with a split top or a solid top. And maybe there is another option. This is a sliding split top. It has an integrated vise that makes the entire top work like a seven foot jaw. The entire top rides on linear rails that allows it to close completely like a solid top or expand up to five inches. You can see the linear rails are added along with these loose tenons. And then the razzle dazzle. Open and close, open and close, open. And if you're wondering who I am, well, this is me. Now let's jump in. Our build begins in my auxiliary lumber storage warehouse, which my wife likes to call her dining room. And there's a lot of milling and there's a lot of cutting, but I'm gonna skip all the basics in this video and focus just on the things that make the sliding split top so different. So let's skip ahead and imagine that we've found ourselves with two giant six and a half inch thick slabs. Now the thickness of these slabs is necessary because we need to embed the vise in the slab. And because they're so thick, the scale of all the work pieces have to be scaled up as well. And that creates some unique challenges, including not being able to pass them through a planer and not being able to mill the parts with a router. Just flipping the tops proved to be a family affair. So there are quite a few things that are otherwise simple tasks that became tedious and complicated. Instead of squaring the edge using a table saw or planer, I had to create spacers and place the slab on the rotary lathe. Next, I added culls to the end of the slab and clamped it down, adding shims to make it perpendicular to the edge of the CNC. Then I can flatten. There will be two loose tenons in the fixed slab, so the sliding slab needs to have two five and a half inch deep mortises cut into them. As you can imagine, this would be extremely time consuming to do by hand. The vise I chose is called the Twin Turbo Vise. Look it up. I flipped the slab over so I can cut a relief in the opposite side because I want the vise to sit flush with the edge face. Now I'm using the smallest twin turbo vise available because I wanted it to also be flush with the bottom of the slab. Once installed, there's about a half inch of solid wood left above the vise. Now the sides are done and the slab can be placed bottom up. Recesses have to be cut 2.5 inches deep to carry the carriage for the linear rails. The carriage will allow the slab to sit exactly 1 16th of an inch above the base. So the milling needs to be precise, perfecto, dead on, money, you get the idea. I secure the carriages with coarse thread machine bolts, then mark the center of the holes with a matching drill bit. Then I draw each hole as carefully and as straight as I can using my Rockler drill guide. The hole needs to be three inches deep before we very, very carefully tip, tip, tippy tap, tap, tap the hole. On a side note, each build I start has a plan and as the build progresses or issues arise, I make changes to measurements or things are usually just close enough. But on this build, I'm executing a plan as designed in hopes that in the end, everything just works. That's the end of the sliding slab. On the fixed slab, dovetail shaped slots are cut four inches wide and four inches deep to hold the loose tenons. The tenons are held in place with dovetail shaped ends and two large bolts. The mechanical joint and the long grain of the tenon offer strong anchor points for the vise bushing. You may be asking yourself at this point, why are these needed at all? Good question, I'm glad you asked. For the vise to open as wide as possible, five inches or so, it means the screw will need to recess into the fixed slab the same amount as the air gap. You also need enough meat to hold the bushing and of course a screw long enough to go through the sliding slab, range a five inch air gap, and still securely attach to the bushings in the fixed slab. You can start to see the problem. Yes! Back to the build. The loose tenons are made with one dovetail shaped end and a slot cut for the bushing to sit in and they're free floating. In other words, they won't be screwed in. The bushing sitting in the slot allows the screws to push and pull against the tenons while preventing the bushing from twisting. Now I've heard that wood moves, 
So the slots are slightly oversized, allowing for subtle movement of the bushing. This should prevent racking of the screws without meaningfully changing the vise functionality. Getting the tenons to fit perfectly in the slots was a process. Luckily, my persuader was available to unstuck them. And after a lot of measuring, and cursing, and sanding, I got a nice smooth fit. On the entire build, I used roundovers on all the mortises and tenons. And that's mainly because I'm lazy. Normally I'd square these off, but looking at all of those five inch deep mortises, no thanks. Uh, I, I think the round looks pretty cool though. Now the first of a few moments of truth. This was extremely satisfying. I might have done this four or five times. The one place I couldn't have roundover corners was the slots for the bushings. The bushings have 90 degree corners and the slots have to match. I mentioned earlier that these are mainly held in place with the mechanical dovetail joint, but there's also two recessed bolts that are installed to prevent any vertical movement. The bolts get recessed one inch deep into the wedges. The holes are cut into the outside edges of the dovetail to allow the vice screws to pass between the bolts and into the fixed slab. Now the loose tenons are permanently installed using the same process I used on the linear rail carriages. First, drill the holes. Second, tap the holes. Finally, add bolts. I made one of the wedges slightly too tall, and this is a good time to ensure everything is flush. Another one of those moments of truth, the initial mating of the sliding and the fixed slabs. Now, if you recall, I said the sliding slab rides 1 16th of an inch above the base. However, the fixed slab is flush with the base. To compensate, I've married the slabs on Baltic birch plywood that's 1 16th of an inch thicker on the sliding half. Now that I'm reflattening the tops, they should realign later when installed on the base. While the slabs are married, I also want to cut them to final length. Now this part doesn't need to be terribly precise, it just needs to be done while the slabs are married so that the ends match perfectly. Well that was easy. We completed the tops in a mere 7.5 minutes, and now we can put them on the base, which I need to build. But fret not, this video doesn't cover the base except as it relates to the sliding top. But other than it being, as those young whippersnappers say, beefy, it's in line with other Rubo builds. I wasn't sure about using walnut for the base, but now that the bench is all completed and I've had a chance to see it as a solid unit, I'm pretty happy with the result. Let me know what you think. Rigidity of the frame was really important to me, so I decided to both glue and bolt the base together. I also added one other feature you might have noticed. If you said cross brace, you would be right. I was looking for ways to further increase the rigidity and this wonderful idea was suggested to me. Beyond just general rigidity, I was worried about the frame racking due to the vise. And so the crisscross is linked to the frame at four points with a half lap joint in the center. Now the next step is to take our perfectly good base and immediately change it. The sliding top can cantilever out seven inches from the edge of the bench. And for it to do that, it has to have a linear rail to sit on. I think you can see where this is going. The linear rail has to sit on something. And so we're gonna to have to add an extension to the base for the linear rail to fully rest on. Now, if you're wondering if the bench is gonna fall over when the sliding top is fully extended, well, survey says it will not. I made these at a 12 quarter stock and they're going to be inset into the leg base by one quarter of an inch. They carry a small part of the load of the linear rail and they're as much for aesthetics as they are for functionality. The insets are cut using a router with an edge guide to define each of the sides and then the bottom, then carefully clearing out the remaining waste. Once I verify the extension fits smoothly, I can square off the corners, then rinse and repeat on the other leg. Because it's end grain, I want to avoid edge sanding once it's installed, so I clean up the top and bottom edges now. Both extensions need to be perfectly level with the already leveled base and fully fill the inset. So when I'm sure I've got it perfect, I glue them in using Type Bond Dark. With the extension installed, I can install the linear rails. 
Now spacing is really important since the carriages are already installed on the sliding top. So I decided to keep this simple and cut a slightly oversized recess for the linear rail to sit in. Which is fine as long as the linear rail is exactly 9 16th of an inch inset. But where they're bolted in is extremely important. The rails must be parallel to each other and perpendicular to the fixed top. Additionally, they must align with the tenons for the vise, and you want the ends of the bench to be in line. So it's very important to measure not just once, not just twice, but 72 times. <laughs> I use the same technique as before with the router and edge guide, but this time with a piece of Baltic birch clamped to the base to provide my straight edge. Before I put on the tops, I want to do any remaining work that might be difficult once the tops are installed. So I'll add the champ for details and I'll also go ahead and apply the finish. The fixed tops sit on two four inch square tenons and four additional eight inch lag screws prevent the top from lifting up, tilting or otherwise shifting. After measuring using all 10 fingers, I tap the holes, bolt in the linear rails and prepare to curse as the moment of truth is soon gonna be upon me. When I mill the edge to accept the twin turbo vise, I cut pilot holes for the screws, but they're only two inches deep. These pilot holes define precisely where to place the holes for the vise screws in relation to the frame. Now it's extremely important to drill perfectly straight. Even a slight deviation will lead to serious problems. The vise backplate didn't sit perfectly on my first test fit, so I made some slight adjustments to the inset frame using a chisel and a rasp. And after a bit of tinkering, I got the back plate to sit smoothly. Now I'm not going to cover the twin turbo vise build in detail because Andrew Klein already does a really good job with it. But suffice to say there are a lot of gears, screws, bushings, and doodads, so it's quite a neat design. When I was designing this bench, I reached out to a number of vise manufacturers without getting anywhere really, except for Andrew. He responded and actually provided feedback on the initial designs, suggested improvements, provided very specific details on his own vice, and was generally friendly. So that's saying something. If you want to learn more about the twin turbo vice, I've linked it in the description below. Earlier I drilled down six inches, and that was enough to test fit the back plate. But now I need to drill all the way through the sliding top. I'm using an 18 inch long auger bit. And again, it's really important to have no deviation in the angle. And now the biggest moment of the build. My wife and I are trying to fit the completed top on the completed base. And to say this was stressful would be an understatement. It should just slide on if everything is right. And if I'm being honest, I wasn't really sure it would work. And then it worked perfectly. This build is rounding third base and headed for home. So let's get back to the vise. With the tops remarried on the base, I need to drill the holes for the screws in the tenons. So I start by using an 18 inch auger bit for the pilot holes. Then we have to remove the tops to complete the process. The screws need to recess into the fixed tops by at least six inches. And to ensure there's room for some movement, I oversize these holes by using a 1.25 inch bit. The fixed top gets reinstalled one last time. And this. And after making sure everything is level, it's back to the vise. Because the bushings aren't screwed into the loose tenons, remember they just float in the slot, someone has to hold them in place while the screws are engaged. The gears are perfectly aligned before fully assembling in hopes that the alignment will be perfect. You can see just how deep the screws of the twin turbo vise recess into the fixed slab once it's removed. Upon the first attempt at using the vise, it doesn't work. It binds. But after some investigating, we find the problem. So, remember how I mentioned the fixed top was installed for the last time? Well, it turns out that the screw and the bushing alignment are off by a quarter of an inch. So, as the vise closes, it starts to bind. Anyway, back off with the top and a bit of chisel work later, and one eighth of an inch has been added to each tenon. Keep in mind, I use the word tenon loosely. 
and then the Razzle Dazzle. The rest of the build is pretty straightforward. I level the top a bit more with the jointing plane and then go over it with the smoothing plane. After, it gets light sanding and then finish. I decided to buy self-adhesive cork and that was a great decision. It's easy to cut, easy to install, and so far it hasn't fallen off. And so while no warranties are expressed or implied, you can find it on Amazon. And then just like that, the sliding split top part is done. But there is one other thing before the bench is fully complete. And that would be the shelving. I went with an interlocking shelf design with a keystone shelf in the middle. I wasn't sure I liked the look of the walnut base until the shelving got installed, but afterwards, I think it looks great. Take a look. And that's it. Sadly, I haven't had a chance to use the workbench much, so I'll probably post a follow-up video about its actual functionality. However, the most common question will be about racking. So I'll note, I towed in the long side of the vise, similar to the way a leg vise is towed in. And this allows the vise to straighten as the jaws are compressed to grip smaller pieces. All I can say for now is, so far, so good. Let me say though, every vise has its uses and half the benefit is being able to expand the bench top to 33 inches. So when I recover, I'll make an insert for the vise that allows a full width solid top. And I always like to hear the specs and stats on a build, so I'll include them in the description. Also, video creation is not really my thing. So this was quite a painful process for me. And if you like this video and you wanna see more, now would be the time to do the thing. The thing, you know, on YouTube. Anyway, one last thing before I go. If you're looking to build any style Rubo bench, I highly recommend the Wood Whisperer Guild Rubo and Hybrid series. They are well worth the money, and having made this video, I have nothing but respect for those series. Thanks so much for watching. Is it recording? Yeah. <gasps> work it, baby. Oh, work it, baby. <laughs> this poor man. The things he puts up with. It's true. No, the things I put up with, that's true. It's not true. It's terrible. <laughs>